Okay. Welcome to the 2021 Watershed Congress. This is Wednesday, September 22nd, day three of our virtual Watershed Congress week. We're happy that you're joining us today. The Watershed Congress is organized by the Delaware Riverkeeper Network in collaboration with many other organizations. My name is Sherry Town. I'm Director of Grants and Operations with the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. I'm also your moderator for this session. Uh, session is titled, How to Become an Effective Clean Water Advocate, Lessons Learned from the Frontlines of the Milford Aquifer. Our speaker today is Vito DiBiase, an environmental activist since 1988 who recently helped form the Friends of the Milford Aquifer to respond to current challenges there. So we're going to let's uh, we're going to begin our presentation. Vito, the floor is yours. Hi, my name is Vito DiBiase. Uh, we are currently uh, kind of a a lot of clean water advocate. Uh, I've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, I did this in from 2004 to 2006, the same aquifer uh, back then was being threatened. And uh, today it's even more threatened. In fact, there's so many uh, land uses that are uh, able to be used and ordinances are being written and we are trying to make sure that those ordinances take care uh, of this aquifer and we're having trouble and we're trying to advocate for these uh, ordinances to be written correctly. Um, so that's my first slide. So this is what we're trying to protect. This is the aquifer uh, about a mile from the Milford Springs and uh, uh, it was a beautiful spring day and here's, uh, here is uh, the history uh, of why this has uh, become a problem. In 1966, uh, PennDOT put I-84 Route 6, uh, the interchange, right on top of the aquifer by accident. And uh, they had, the reason why they knew that is the Milford Springs were getting turbidity and they had to, uh, uh, make their efforts a little bit better. And they actually had to compensate the mill for, uh, for their springs being uh, turbulent. And that's how the mill for water authority started. So even though they made that mistake, the interchange is still there. So then in 1989, there was a mall proposal and this uh, group of people called Pike County Defenders rose up. Uh, Peter Pincho was able to put the Salt Hill Creek value stream and that stopped the uh, mall. Then in 2000, there was a Home Depot proposal that was defeated by a group called MADSET and they used the chemical tracer test to find out that yes, indeed, where Home Depot was going to be uh, put, they were going to have to have uh, the uh, tracers show that it, there's a direct connection from that land to the springs. Then from 2004 to 2006, there was 118 acres. Uh, the Dingman Township was uh, trying to put into an RC zone, which is a resort commercial zone, which is their uh, most uh, open zone, uh, most permitted things. And what happened there is it was a compromise. They got their 118 acres, but then the Salt Hill Creek uh, watershed ordinance was passed uh, by Dingman Township. So it was like, um, you know, you get the 118 acres and you also now have uh, an ordinance that tries to restrict uh, buildings there. But then here comes 2021 because uh, most of the activity stopped because of the 2008 uh, market crash. So now here we are in 2021 and now all these properties around uh, the I-84 Route 6 interchange uh, are now uh, being sold and bought as prime commercial. Uh, and there are all these new threats and in fact, this is probably the most threats ever because there's so many pieces of land uh, being sold and bought uh, for development. And then <clears throat> just a few months ago, 
um, Milford Township, which never had an ordinance like Dingman Township had. Uh, so they're like 15 minutes late to the game. Um, they're proposing an ordinance, but it is being written by Mr. Shepstone and it has many, many flaws that we are trying to defeat. So that's where we're, and we're right in the middle of it. And these next two weeks are very, very crucial. Uh, so then what happened was on May 7th, I started a group called the Friends of the Milford Aquifer. And, um, and that was started with four people and we now have 108. So I'm gonna break this uh, presentation down into six major parts. Because I'm an art teacher, I did it with the primary colors and the secondary colors. So in the primary colors, uh, you need to have research skills. You need to have, know how to make coalition building. Uh, you need to have communication skills. So those are the three foundations that then you can do all the other things with. Then you can use your media savvy, you can use your political acuity, and then you can use whatever personality gifts you are you have. Uh, in my instance, I'm an art teacher and I, uh, I like to make maps and I like photography and that kind of thing. So uh, that's what I use. In terms of research skills, this is the most important thing because you have to know uh, what you're talking about, what the issues are, if you're ever going to be able to be a good advocate. Uh, that means you have to study uh, as many uh, primary sources you can get your hands on and uh, be uh, fully versed in the ins and outs of the problem. So uh, the biggest uh, research, is, the first uh, study is the source water protection plan from the Milford Springs that was done in 2006, it was finished. Um, you can see June 6, uh, 2006. That is what is called, uh, the Milford Water Authority person said, that's their bread and butter. Uh, it was a study that was done uh, by taxpayer money from the DEP and other professional hydrologists brought in called Todd Giddings. And he uh, delineated where the aquifer was. And uh, that is the most important thing that he did. And then he said in his, in his writing, he said the Second dangerous threat to the springs is large commercial development at uh, the I-84 Route 6 interchange. And <clears throat> the first is, of course, uh, they have a spill response uh, team ready to go because if anything happens uh, going up the hill on Route 6 or on 84 uh, with a tanker truck, uh, there is a problem because uh, the aquifer is so fast that any kind of spill in that area around the uh, interchange uh, or, you know, down six towards the springs, if you have, and even further out in the watershed, uh, because the spill response goes out six miles. Uh, so anything like that uh, would go rapidly into the aquifer and be at the springs uh, in as little as eight hours. That's how fast it is. Uh, and that's right around the interchange. Anything bad happens there, they have to stop it before it gets into the aquifer. Uh, because if it does, it'll be at the springs in as little as eight hours. So then the second study was done around the same time in 2004. And it says the exact same thing. The proximity of commercial development around the US Route 684 poses the largest threat to the fragile water source of the Milford Borough. So you have two major studies. Uh, one was also, uh, it says uh, Hydro Princeton. Uh, that's another hydrology company uh, that did that study. So here it is, here's the aquifer. Um, this is what the first study showed 
uh, the source water protection plan. It calls it a zone two of the Milford Springs. And that green area is your aquifer. The star is your spring. So the star is just on a curve on route six. And if you were to take a, a, a ride up six and go from end from the springs all the way to the end of the green line, that's about two and a half miles long. So it's about two and a half miles long and it is about 2000 feet wide. So the problem with an aquifer like this is that you can't see it. It's underground. So people don't understand. Hey, they see an, they see an intersection. They already see those two gas stations and there's a professional plaza there. All that was done before these studies were done. So all that um, prior development near the interchange was all done before the science came in in 2005 and six, all right? Uh, nothing really big since then has been put there. Uh, now, because you can't see it as an artist and as, a, uh, as an imaginative thinker, I said, why don't you think of it as a lake? Uh, so I filled in, you can see it's the same shape, uh, I filled in the aquifer and I said, let's pretend it's a lake, right? And the reason why that's effective is because you can then say to, um, you know, the regular man on the street, you say to him, you know, would you put a, a gas station, another one, floating in the middle of your reservoir for your drinking water? And that would be absurd because you wouldn't. If you saw that as a lake, because it's a lake, but it's a lake underground that you can't see. But let's pretend it's your reservoir that you can see. So you wouldn't want to put uh, any kind of anything floating on top of your, your reservoir. That would be absurd. And so it's the same thing. That's what we're trying to impress on our leaders and we're trying to educate the public uh, to that fact. So here is the whole watershed. This is the Sock Hill Creek watershed and a little bit of the Vandermark Creek watershed. And in the middle, that orange section is the aquifer again. It's that same shape that I made into a lake before on the slide before, but now it's uh, orange and it has red li uh, orange line, uh, yellow lines through it. And you see where the springs are. And you see the intersection of Route 84 and Route 6, all right? And so again, from uh, the star, which is the Milford Springs, out to the end of the orange, which is the actual aquifer, two and a half miles. But if you go from the springs all the way to the end of the uh, watershed there, that's six miles. And in total land, you're talking about um, 13 square miles is the aquifer, the orange. The whole entire watershed is about, uh, it's like 23 for the Sauk Hill and the extra, and it's about, so it's about 33 square miles. Now, what uh, we are so blessed with this aquifer is that most of the uh, upper lands where the water uh, percolates into the ground is Delaware State Forest. It's also hunting clubs and it's also the Milford Experimental Forest. Now the Milford Experimental Forest is about 1400 acres. Uh, so that's a good piece, but right at the very end is where this land is to be, de to be developed. It's actually being sold as prime commercial and it's right on top of the aquifer. And we're trying to say to these people, it's not prime commercial. It's your aquifer. So why are you selling it as prime commercial? So it would be a shame. You have this whole beautiful watershed that's mostly forested. And then at the very end, 
about 5,000 to 2,000 feet uh, toward your spring, you're all you're already gonna now you're gonna put uh, big development. You would pollute it right at the very end, and um, and we feel that's not proper. So what's most important to understand about the Milford Aquifer is that it's an unconfined aquifer. And I know this because uh, I got a letter from Earl Verbeek and Earl is a, a, a research a geologist and he sent me a letter to give to, and he also sent it to Dingman Township in 2006 and tried to explain to Dingman Township that the Milford Aquifer is an unconfined aquifer. And so what that means, if you look at the diagram there, you see the water table, and then you see right underneath the water table is unconfined aquifer. See how close it is to the top of the land? It's very, very close. And actually, there's a lot of places where it pops up as wetlands. There's wetlands all around uh, the I-84 Route 6 interchange. In fact, there's actually one inside the circle, that, uh, the off-ramp. There's actually an aquifer right in there. I mean, a, a wetland right there. And that's your unconfined aquifer rising up. Now, what makes it unconfined is that the top of the land is what's called um, uh, permeable surface, which means it's a very fine, Grain, uh, sand and gravel from uh, way back when, 20,000 years ago, uh, when there was uh, the glaciers. And so it left behind all this sand and gravel. And that is the top of your aquifer. There is no uh, beds uh, of bedrock in between uh, to uh, like a confined aquifer. A confined aquifer, if you can see, it's underneath a confining bed, like bedrock, clay, and stuff like that. So you, you have to drill to get down into a confined aquifer. Uh, your unconfined aquifer is going to bubble up like it does in the springs down on the uh, bottom of the hill here. Um, and what they say about an unconfined aquifer is that it's rapid, meaning that anything uh, goes right in, there's nothing to stop it, it's just sand and gravel. Uh, so if you were to pour something toxic, uh, even washing off of um, a parking lot, anything that would collect any kind of gas or oil, uh, and then of course, if it's on a uh, blacktop, it's gonna be hot, and then it would come uh, and even if they put like uh, containing um, uh, ponds, you know, those ponds would be actually dug into the sand and gravel, which means it's going to continue to go right in. It might slow it down just a little, but it's not going to be like a confined aquifer where there's lots of bedrock to stop it. So. <clears throat> The next thing you have to understand, uh, oh, and, and the unconfined aquifer is very sensitive uh, to any kind of toxins uh, because there's no protective barrier. It, whatever is on the top goes right in. Um, and in fact, if you look at the sign that Chan has on the 44 acres, uh, that's like the most uh, prime piece of land before the springs, uh, it says sand and gravel. Well, he's telling you what's there. That sand and gravel is the aquifer. It's the unconfined aquifer. Then the other thing you have to worry about, and this was what uh, biologist Faith Zerbe uh, said at the uh, public hearing uh, for Dingman Township in March. And uh, because once again, Dingman Township uh, expanded the RC zone on top of the aquifer in March. Uh, so that's going backwards. Uh, and then, so Faith came to testify. Uh, she's from the Delaware River Network. And she talked about <clears throat> uh, impervious surfaces. And what impervious surfaces are like uh, blacktop 
uh, and build and rooftops of buildings where the water just can't get into the ground. And so you can imagine if you put a lot of blacktop on top of your uh, sand and gravel, where the water usually percolates right down in, now you've disturbed uh, the aquifer from its function. Uh, and science has proven with, uh, these are diagrams from many of the studies, there's more, but these are uh, two of the uh, easiest ones to understand, is that uh, as impervious surfaces increase, so does water degradation. That also increases. So uh, if you get to about 10%, most studies agree that if you have 10% of impervious surface, then the water is okay. It can function. Uh, the, the aquifer can function. But if you get over 10%, you start seeing uh, degradation in uh, either the streams or the aquifer. So you have both things in the Milford aquifer. You have a stream, the South Kill Creek, and excuse me, and you have the unconfined aquifer. So the two are acting together. Um, so you would see uh, a lot of effects in the stream. That would probably be your first indication. Uh, and then they say, once you get over 20% to 25% of impervious surface, like uh, highways and parking lots and roofs, then you start seeing major degradation. And so major that once you pass 25 to 30% impervious surface, then your aquifer and water uh, is no longer uh, in good shape. It's actually irretrievable from being fixed. Um, so, and, and you can see, uh, you know, up on the top where you, you have the forest and then you have some houses and then you have more development to, to, to a town. Uh, and as you keep going up that route, you get worse and worse water. Uh, and then on the bottom, it shows how the trout uh, start to change and then how your um, water in your stream starts to uh, get less and less uh, uh, invertebrates and stuff like that. So <clears throat> once you understand uh, the science, uh, then you have to start, then you uh, can start your coalition building. And we started with a core of four people. Then I started making, and my, with the help of my friends, we started making emails and phone calls and going to uh, the meetings, uh, you know, at the municipalities. Um, and I call, I got my first call from a sister group, so I called the Damascus Citizens for Sustainability, and she gave me uh, my first advice. Uh, because they have been doing this for 12 years or so. Uh, and they actually finally won uh, a victory with the uh, stopping of fracking in the Delaware uh, watershed. And then my next uh, major uh, contact was air, soil, and water. They were a local group in Milford that fought the Tennessee pipeline. Uh, but they lost. But they then morphed into a sustainability uh, a movement, and they are featuring the uh, farmer's market uh, in Milford every Sunday. So it kind of went from fighting the Tennessee pipeline to uh, a sustainability group. But we were able to tap into their membership, and she acts as my sister uh, group and allows me to post on her website. So then we created our own group, Friends of the Milford Aquifer. And then uh, I did a blitzkrieg of emails to all these organizations. And one of them was the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. And I remember sometime in March sending, I found every person I could possibly find on the website in their email, and I emailed them. And uh, when we went to the uh, March uh, public hearing, 
I didn't know if my emails worked, but all of a sudden there was Faith Zerby from the Delaware Riverkeeper Network uh, testifying uh, on our behalf and on behalf of the Delaware Riverkeeper Network. So you never know. You send these emails out and you hope for the best. You hope somebody's listening and honest to God, it works sometimes. So then I reached out to just about every other environmental group that I could think of. And uh, some of them have uh, given us active support like the Sierra Club and the uh, Northeast Audubon Society with their email lists and stuff like that. Uh, some have uh, not. I had uh, many conversations with Penn Environment uh, and she said she couldn't help us right, you know, uh, specifically, but she gave me advice and maybe we can call in on those people at a later date. Uh, I called the Catskill Mountain Keeper and he actually, I sent him an email and he actually called me back and we talked on the phone and uh, hopefully in the future we can, uh, you know, uh, get some help from them. Uh, always been sending stuff to the League of Women Voters since day one. Um, it's a very uh, delicate uh, political tightrope that they have to run. Uh, so, um, you know, they have to be able to be neutral. And I understand that. And we uh, look to them for advice because they have been advocates for clean water for many, many, many years uh, with funding and help and uh, publications and stuff like that. So they're, they're very helpful and the water is one of their issues. So they're always good to have uh, to keep close by. Um, and even if I'm not formally connected to these people, uh, these groups, uh, I have sent emails to all of them uh, and we have been, in a, you know, uh, some of them I, well, with the Milford Water Authority, um, again, it's a very fragile uh, type of relationship because we're an advocacy group and they're an authority and they view their role in sometimes as just advisory and that's it. And uh, I'm trying to push them to be a, a little more forceful with their voice. Uh, which can cause friction sometimes. But actually, uh, we sat down with the Milford Water Authority, some of our members, and they offered us uh, an hour of their time off the record to sit and chat with them, which was eye-opening, very helpful. Uh, it doesn't mean we see exactly eye to eye, but we understand each other more. Um, and we will still be, uh, it looks like, and we are gonna keep encouraging that. Uh, Gray Towers was my first presentation uh, over Zoom. I gave a presentation to the Gray Tower Chairs Association and we got about half of them uh, on our page uh, and the other half were more traditional and didn't wanna get involved in politics. Um, I keep sending stuff to the Milford Enhancement Committee because they, have similar goals uh, of trying to beautify um, Milford and same with the Garden Club. And we're trying to do the same thing. Uh, we're trying to keep sprawl from consuming Milford. And because Milford is a diamond in the rough, people come to Milford to live and to uh, visit because it's a quaint town. Uh, because it's not like the sprawl you see in New Jersey and uh, New York and places. Nice, uh, beautiful looking town, like a throwback to a, a, a simpler era. We have lots of historical buildings and that's the charm. Now, if you uh, go against that and bring in lots of sprawl, and ruin your uh, drinking water, uh, then that becomes a major economic problem. 
And many of the towns around us have found, like New Windsor, New York, and Newburgh, New York, found that if they ignored uh, or didn't pay attention to what they were doing with the aquifer, they paid the price because now their, um, their water system is polluted and they have, they're now scrambling for uh, replacement water that costs lots and lots of money. So they're in an economic hole now because of not paying attention to their aquifer and their, and their watershed. I gave a presentation to the Delaware Valley Action um, and that went very well. Uh, I got a nice uh, letter uh, thanking me. Um, we keep the Pike County Historical Society uh, close at hand. We always keep sending them emails because in the future, I think uh, the goals that I have and the Milford, uh, Friends of the Milford Aquifer is that instead of putting um, sprawl on top of your uh, on top of your aquifer, I think we should put a nature preserve uh, with wild, uh, you know, with uh, native plants and uh, you know, a very nice place for people to come and do walks and wellness, uh, shin garden uh, and a memorial garden and uh, lots of uh, tie-ins and even a Lenape Indian idea that, that uh, we've been toying around with, but we wanna keep under wraps until it's further developed. So then you need to do all this, you need to have communication skills. Um, and that starts with basic writing, your sentence structure, using metaphor, simile, and onomatopoeia. Uh, you have to learn how to edit because, you know, if you go on too long or if you write too long, people are not going to read it. Um, you have to have the art of argument. You need to know how to rebut something. Uh, I'm not going to get into the hierarchy too much, but just so you understand, name calling is not what you want. That's zero points. Uh, if you're making ad hominem attacks on people uh, with that are baseless, that's not good. Uh, if you're just responding to somebody screaming at you uh, and that's all you're doing, then the tone is wrong. Uh, but believe me, they are going to scream at you. Uh, because this has been a 55-year-old problem. Um, the politics are a certain way and things have been done a certain way. And so when anyone comes in and tries to alter that way of things being done, uh, they start to uh, slap back at you. Uh, meaning uh, we were called NIMBYs in the newspaper, which means not in my backyard. That's a very similar thing uh, water advocates get, uh, but you just have to let that go in one ear and out the other, because you, if you understand the science and you understand uh, what can happen if you don't follow the science, then you are uh, on the right track and they are not. Um, use a positive persuasion tone. It's all in your attitude, uh, you know, don't get bogged down into a tit for tat if, if you're running into trouble. Just try to stay positive and keep your arguments coming. If your arguments are correct, if they're factual, uh, what can they do about it? Uh, and also try to balance out reason and emotion. And, and when you are writing, it's always good to um, say it out loud. Uh, my wife, I read them to her and she checks for uh, maybe phrasing. She can do a little bit off. It's always nice to have somebody checking your tone and how it sounds because if it sounds good when you read it, it's like poetry. And, and that's a good thing. People will get an, uh, be attracted to the writing if it's good writing. Um, so one of the examples of uh, trying to uh, write is a mission statement. 
and we had to write a mission statement early for our group, Friends of the Milford Aquifer. You can see we made it short and simple. Um, it's a little bit longer than there, but you get the idea. Uh, then to attract people to our cause, because you know we can go to these meetings, but if they only see us, that's all they think is out there. But if they see a petition, uh, then you know more people are involved, and so they pay more attention, especially if they look at the signatures and see a lot of their uh, prominent people in town that have signed it, okay? And that's very important so that they know the uh, voters are watching. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate the public and educate the voters so that they know exactly what their representatives are doing on this aquifer and how it can harm their drinking water. So um, you have to be media savvy and you actually have to create news events. Uh, and sometimes you can create news events just by going to municipal meetings and making a public comment. And so this one meeting uh, we went to a month ago, that's the planners of Milford Township. At that meeting, we found out uh, that the Milford Water Authority and Milford Township, even though they had two workshops, had major communication problems between them. And uh, they were the wishes of the Milford Water Authority were not being honored. And they tried to get that across. And it seemed like uh, they were having trouble. Uh, and so that's why it's good to be there because then you can say you can be the conduit that tries to fix that problem. Um, so the river reporter had a reporter there that day and uh, we made it into their newspaper. And then uh, a couple months before that, I wrote uh, actually about another month ago, I wrote a My View, which is a little bit longer than a letter to the ed editor. And they published it as a My View, the River Reporter. And it was ordinance breakthrough possible. And I was trying to outline how it is possible to fix that ordinance and how we can actually uh, make a breakthrough uh, and try to fix this 55 year old problem. And then over on this side, I went to the commissioner's meeting and that's always good because that is videotaped, uh, live fed, and there are reporters there. And the reporter that was there for the dispatch, Pike County dispatch is Chris Jones. And he, uh, I asked the Pike County commissioners if they would help in this problem since they are the ones that uh, set the tone and um, uh, policy in the county. And they said, no, uh, they uh, thought that the Milford Water Authority and Milford uh, Township were the experts and they should play out the, uh, they should play it out. And as we know, uh, that's not true because uh, some other, uh, 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 consultants, the planner is very, very pro industry, uh, and the other one never even read uh, any of the source water protection, didn't even know the source water protection plan existed, and he was writing the ordinance. So you have two guys, one that didn't know uh, anything about the aquifer, and then you have the other guy who's like very industry prone, and they were the two people writing the ordinance. And so uh, you can see where that could lead to a problem. And then uh, again, I wrote a letter to the editor, uh, protect the aquifer before it's too late. Now, newspapers are old traditional ways of getting your message across. So that's why uh, social media is important uh, and you have to have uh, media savvy skills there. So when you're doing a presentation, you have to know who your audience is. Uh, you package your message uh, with visual uh, elements like uh, 
every time I tried to uh, make a message to all those platforms there, the Facebook platforms, no for Scott Talent, no for PA, no for conversations, and so on and so forth. And there was eight of them. And so once I put out a statement, I, I kind of uh, chop it down into smaller pieces into a smaller statement and then use my photography of uh, butterflies to attract people to that statement. And that was like a, a game I played to kind of catch people to my message by not being too political. But then on Friends of the Milford Aquifer, well, we have 105 members now, uh, started with four, and then in four months we had 105. Um, that's where I can be more political and actually I can publish my stuff. I don't have to worry, wait for a newspaper to publish it. I can use my platform and threads in the Milford Aquifer. And then I have my sister group, Air, Soil and Water, who allows me to do the same on her website. So you have to know, you know what you can do with certain websites and what you can't do. And then of course you have to learn Zoom because of the pandemic. And, um, and then again, I always use email to try to uh, amplify our message uh, I even send it to people. Uh, I'll show you in a second here. Uh, okay, well, let's let's do this first. So then you you go into political acuity. Um, so you, first thing you have to show up uh, to meetings either on Zoom or in person. You have to know how policy is made in municipalities. They make land use laws. Uh, how is it made? It's made in a planning board where the professional consultants are consulted and they make uh, recommendations and send it up to the supervisors who have public hearings and then before it becomes a law. Uh, you wanna try to get it in the planning board stage because that's places where you can do uh, more uh, changes before it gets up to a public hearing. Then at the County level, the commissioners set policy and um, budgets and stuff like that. They have the conservation district that takes care of land use problems. And they also have a planning board. And uh, I always send stuff uh, to both the conservation district and the planning board. Uh, I've been in many conversations with both uh, places. Then uh, you also then keep going up. Uh, then there are other players in the in the in uh, Pike County, the Economic Development Authority, uh, the Pike County Chamber of Commerce. Now, uh, not everybody there is going to be uh, amenable to our suggestions, but it's always good to try. There might be one or two or three in there that are uh, amenable to your ideas and may work from within. Uh, I even had a long conversation with the Economic Development Authority person. And so it's always good to keep the lines open, even to people that may not agree with you. I have not yet got to the governor. Uh, I tried Bob Casey and Pat Toomey. I did get a call back from Pat Toomey, and he led me to his office, led me to somebody in Wilkes-Barre that can help us write grants for conservation easement money. And um, there are uh, other levels in the state government, the DEP and the Department of Conservation National Resources. They may have programs like that conservationtool.org uh, for conservation easements, which is what we're trying to, the goal of our group is to get that aquifer land into conservation easements so it's protected forever. And then we also know that in the US Fish and Wildlife Service, there are funds available to do that. And we have, uh, we at least tried uh, initial contact, uh, but we have to follow up on that. Um, and then lastly, use your, um, your personality gifts, you know, your sense of humor. Uh, I made aquifer bear. Uh, so he's, he's got aquifer, and he became the um, guardian of the aquifers. And he's, uh, you know, 
uh, stands there with his trident and shield and, and uh, tries to protect the aquifer the best he can. Uh, and that was in the 2006 um, uh, Black Bear Festival. Then, of course, my photography over there with my uh, monarchs, I did a whole series. And every time I sent out a message over those Facebook platforms, I used my um, uh, monarch uh, butterfly uh, pictures to try to lure people into my message. Uh, use your interpersonal skills, try to keep uh, group camaraderie, have fun, go on hikes, uh, promote leadership, have a good plan. Um, I have a vision and a plan. Uh, like I said, we're, we're trying to say, instead of putting uh, more sprawl and on the wrong place, why don't you put a nature preserve? Uh, and all these community groups can have buy-in into that idea and actually take part in that idea. And it's in keeping with our um, uh, legacy of Gifford Pinchot, uh, who said the greatest good for the most people for the longest in the long run. So uh, if you're putting sprawl on your aquifer, um, is that for the greatest good? Because 2,400 people will depend on it downtown and 15 million people depend on the Delaware River downstream for their drinking water. So you have to balance property rights uh, with the human right to have clean water. And uh, it's all Ravania uh, constitution with the help of the uh, Delaware River, uh, River Network. They were able to help get that article 27 of the PA constitution that says Pennsylvania residents have a right to pure water. And that's encoded in law now. And uh, so uh, that was one of the reasons why they were able to win the ban on fracking in the Delaware River uh, network. Uh, so we're part of the Delaware River network. And what we're saying to people and what my winning argument to the Delaware River network and to the Catskill Mountain Keeper was, the Delaware can die by a thousand cuts, which means these little tributaries like the South Hill, if they're controlled by legislators that don't care about the aquifer, then you can lose at the municipal level because they make your land use laws. And if you keep losing at the municipal level, then the Delaware can die by a thousand cuts. That's why we have to be in the trenches, at the front lines, at the municipalities where land use laws are made and we have to stand firm. We have to go against the, the regular way of doing things and say, no, uh, you have to do it a new way. We're in the age of climate change. It's on the TV every night and uh, people can see it now. And so now is the time to change minds and change directions. Uh, and like Lao Tzu says there, Chinese proverb, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. And that's exactly what's happening in, in our township. They are heading in the wrong direction. And that's where they're going to end up if we don't and a better future for the people of our town. Um, also, like I said, they are going to slap back at you. So you have to know how to handle that. Um, get support from your friends when that happens. Uh, I called up my original people from Damascus Citizens and because they've been, they've weathered those kind of storms and have been through that and know how to get out at the other end. And you just, you're uh, based in science. If you have read the uh, primary sources, 
uh, then you have a great foundation. Nobody can change facts if they're facts and they're accurate. Um, and then just have the, I, the idea that you can do it. Take the way the T off of can't and just cut it off and say, yes, you can. You guys can do this. You've been doing it wrong all these years for 55 years. You've made some progress and then you fall back and make some more progress, but then you take, so it's like three steps forward, two steps back, and it's an endless cycle. And we gotta, we gotta stop the cycle now and chart a better course permanently and get this land into conservation easements. There's lots of money in federal and uh, state programs, and there's lots of, uh, private foundations that will help out, it's there. If Port Jervis can do it, uh, if they can petition the state for a million dollars and get it, uh, we can do the same. Uh, if Middletown, uh, a half hour away, can do it and petition their state, then we can do it too. Um, Vito? Um... And just remember, it's a moral and ethical uh, social justice thing you're doing. You know, we're um, just about uh, five minutes before um, we're going to come to the end of our time. Um, we're going to have a, just a couple announcements at the end. Um, so okay. we don't really um, have a lot of time for questions, um, but if you can uh, maybe uh, summarize if there was just like your, 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 your last words of wisdom that you'd like to, to pass along here. Um, just like what is, let me, if you wanted to you know, summarize a, a final, you know, one big thing, what, what might it be? What might that be that one most important piece of information you want to share? Well, um, like I said, they're going to uh, slap back in a sense because they've been doing things a certain way. And so, um, just remember, you have the right to petition your government. You can go to uh, municipal meetings. That's why they have a public comment. Don't be afraid to exercise your right. People have died for that right uh, in World War II and all the other wars so that we have these rights to stand, speak freely, and try to uh, push our lawmakers in the right direction. Uh, you have that right, and if they yell at you and say, I'm going to sit you down, if you do, do not stop talking, uh, tell them you have a right to be there and to uh, stand up for not only your rights to clean water, but the human right and the social justice issue uh, that clean water represents. Thank you, Vito. Um, I'm afraid it's time we're going to need to wrap up our session. Um, I want to thank Vito once again for taking the time to share his his knowledge and experience uh, with the, um, the the Milford Aquifer and and uh, his um, uh, life experience in, in advocacy uh, and the the years he's been involved with um, fighting for the environment. Thanks everyone for joining us.